All right, this video is gonna go over the beginning of the final exam review packet. So we start with our exponential functions. All right, so and the exponential functions were from your original book in 5.1. So when we graph these, we make a table of coordinates like it says. We plug in negative one, zero, and one. So then five to the negative first would be one fifth. Five to the zero power is one because anything in the zero power is one. And five to the first would be five. And then we plot these coordinate points. So negative one and one fifth, zero and one, one and five. And then there's a horizontal asymptote at your x-axis, so we don't cross through there, and this would be increasing as you move from left to right. So if I was to march, match that with the choices, it would be B. Two is from that same section. This time your base is a fraction, so it's going to go in the opposite direction, but we'll find that out by plugging in the points. So one-half, negative one would be two, one-half to the zero would be one, and one-half to the first would be one-half. So if I plot, negative one, two, zero, one, one, and one half. And this way, it's coming this way. So again, matching it to the graph below, and that would be C. Number three, you're using the graph of f of x equals e to the x to find e to the x minus three. So if we did not have calculators, we would approximate e to the x, or e to the first to be 2.7. But because you're going to have a scientific calculator, you can take and plug in just like we did before. Negative 1, 0, and 1. So e to the negative 1 minus 3, e to the 0 minus 3, and e to the first minus 3. So e to the negative 1 is a point 36, so point 0.4 minus 3, or negative 2.6. E to the 0 would be 1, minus 3 would be negative 2. And E to the first is 2.7, minus 3 is negative 0 0.3. And then you're going to plot those points, so negative 1 and negative 2.6. 0 and negative 2, and 1 and negative 0.3. So now there's a vertical shift, which we know because of this minus 3, that horizontal asymptote has shifted down to negative 3, and our curve would go up from there. If we look at the graph, C is the only one that does that. So you could have just looked at, if it was multiple choice, from the beginning, seeing that there's a vertical shift down 3, and know that that's where your vertical asymptote would shift, and then you could have gone straight to C without having to plug those points in. All right, 4 says uh, write the equation and its equivalent log form. So this we're just converting. The base on the exponential becomes the base on the log, which rules out this one and this one and this one. So log base 8, the pair together separates. The y comes over with the 8, and it equals 2, which means b is the answer here. Now we're graphing the log. So this says to graph the log of base 4 of x. Or we're going to graph from here, but with the logs, we're plugging in for y. So I'm going to switch. I'm going to make this y equals negative 2 plus log base 4 of x. Convert it to exponential. I'm going to add the 2 to the other side. y plus 2 equals log base 4 of x. The 4 is going to come over and pick up the y plus 2. And then we plug in. So I plug in negative 1 plus 2, 0 plus 2, and 1 plus 2. I get 4 to the first, which is 4, 4 to the second, which is 16, and 4 to the third, which is 64. So with a log function, you have a vertical asymptote at 0. And if I plot these, I'd get 4, negative 1, 16, 0 would be all the way down here, and then 64 all the way over here. So my graph is going to do this. If you look at the options, D is the only one that resembles that. All right, this one says to graph both of these in the same grid. So for 3 to the x, I'm going to plug in the negative 1, 0, and 1. 
So 3 to the negative 1 is 1 third, 3 to the 0 is 1, and 3 to the first is 3. So negative 1, 1 third, 0, 1, and 1, 3. My graph for that one's going to look like that. If you look at all your answer choices, all of them except for D has that one. Then I want to plot the log. So y would equal log base 3 of x. 3 is going to come pick up the y. Plug in for the uh, y. Negative 1, 0, 1. So y to the, or sorry, 3 to the negative 1 would be 1 third. 3 to the 0 is 1, and 3 to the first is 3. So now I'm at 1 third, negative 1, 1, 0, and 3, 1. Okay, these are also inverses of each other. So this is A. So once you know that 3 to the x does this, if you were to fold it along that y equals x line, it would duplicate onto the other side, and that would give you the log with the same base. All right, now we're doing logs. So this is where your mental math comes into play, especially when it says without a calculator. If it just says log, that means log base 10, and log base 10 to the 1 half, that 1,000 would be what power would I raise 10 to to get to 1,000? And the 10s are easy. You just count the zeros. So there would be 3 there. Ln of 1 over e to the 5th. Remember, ln is a natural log. So this is the same thing as saying log base e. If I bring the e to the top, it's e to the negative 5th. And then the bases are the same, and we keep what's next to it. You could have also rewritten this as ln of e to the negative 5, and then ln of e cancels, giving you the exponent. You could also expand it, which we're going to do in a minute. So this was actually the start of 5.2, which was also the, the graphs of logs. This one says evaluate or simplify without using the calculator. So again, an ln of e crosses out and just leaves you with the exponent, which would be d. The properties of logs started in 5.3. So this is your expanding and condensing. So with 10, we are expanding this. When you expand a fraction, it becomes subtraction. So it would be log base 2 of square root of x and log base 2 of 4. And then if this square root is in your function, it's the same thing as saying the 1 half power minus 2 to what power gives me 4? This is 2. And then this 1 half power is going to get bumped to the front. So it's 1 half log base 2 of x minus 2, which is c. 11, this is square root, would be log base 7 of 7 to the 1 half. The base on the log and the base on the exponential function are the same, so we can cancel it out, keeping it with the exponent, which would be 1 half. 12, now we're expanding log base b of y. Multiplication becomes addition, so plus log base b of z to the fourth, and then the fourth gets bumped to the front. So log base b of y plus 4 log base b of z. 13, you want to see if you could use this, get it to the same base and use the one-to-one -one property. So I cannot, like the square root of 243 is not 27, which means I have to break these down. 243 would be 3 and 81, which is 3 and 27, which is 3 and 9, which is 3 and 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 3. So 3 to the 5th raised to the x, that's there from here, would equal 27 is 3 to the 3rd. Now the base is the same, so we can set the exponents equal to each other. 5x would equal 3, divide both sides by 5, and x equals 3 fifths. So that's a. Okay, 14 and 15, it says use the property of logs to condense, and then write the expression as a single log whose coefficient is 1, where possible evaluate. So the coefficient 1 means that there shouldn't be anything at the front of these logs. So with 14, these are both going to get the 1 third here. So this would be log base 6 of x to the 1 third plus log base 6 of y to the 1 third. And that means that the, that's the cube root of x plus log base 6y cube root of y. When it's addition, it becomes multiplication. So I can multiply these together because they both have the same square root. 
or both index and the square root, and I'd get log base 6 of the cube root of x times y, which is a. 15, this is going to get the 5, so I get log base bm to the 5th minus log base bn. The minus becomes division, so log base bm to the 5th over n, which is b. 16, solve the exponential equation. So now we're doing exponential equations, and this is 5.4. So if there's only one base on either side of the equal sign and we can't get it to be the same, we're going to ln both sides of our equations. So then ln of e x plus 2 equals ln of 4. ln of e cancels, giving you what the exponent is. So x plus 2 equals ln of 4. And then I would subtract the 2. So x equals ln of 4 minus 2. Seventeen again two exponents or two bases that can't be changed to be the same. So I would do eight to the three x equals two point three. We're gonna ln both sides of the equation. The three x bumps to the front this time, ln of eight equals ln of two point three. Divide both sides by the ln of eight and the three. You can do both at the same time. And I get x equals ln of 2.3 divided by 3 ln of 8, which is this last one. 18, it says by expressing each as the power of the same base. So we want to move e to the top. So this is e x plus 7 equals, this would be e to the negative 10. And then the base is the same. So we set the exponents equal to each other. x plus 7 equals negative 10. Subtract the 7 and x equals negative 17. 19, we are going to condense. We have two logs on one side of the equal sign. So we're going to condense because it's at addition, it becomes multiplication. So log of 2, x plus 1 times x minus 5 would equal 4. 2 is going to come over and pick up the 4. So 2 to the 4th would equal, expand this side out, x squared minus 5x plus x minus 5, and I'd get 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, which is 16, equals x squared minus 4x minus 5. Move the 16 on the other side because we're going to have to factor. 21, 21, that's sum to negative 4, would be negative 7 and positive 3 and then split and solve, and I get x equals 7 and x equals negative 3. Now, when you've got a log in the original equation, you want to check them by plugging them back in here. If I get 7 plus 1, I can find the log of that. If I do 7 minus 5, here's 2, I can do the log of that. So that answer gets kept. If I plug in negative 3 plus 1, I'm finding the log of a negative number, and that cannot happen, so we rule out the negative 3 and just keep 7 as the answer. All right, 20, you have two LNs on either side of the equal sign, and it's a subtraction sign. So we're going to condense by dividing x minus 9 over x plus 6 would equal x minus 5 over x plus 2. So then we can cross multiply x minus 9 times x plus 2 equals x minus 5 over x plus 6. I'd get x squared minus 7x minus 18 equals x squared plus x minus 30. Subtract the x squared. It's going to cancel from both sides. Add the 7x. Neg negative 18 would equal 8x minus 30. Add the 30. 8x would equal 12. Divide both sides by 8. And x is 12 eighths or 3 halves. Again, you can check.
Okay, uh, and then we started with trig. So this is radians. For 21, we're converting from radians to degrees. So to do radians to degrees, we take theta and we multiply it times 180 over pi. So I'm going to take the 12 over pi over 3, multiply it times 180 over pi. The pi's are going to cancel. The 3 goes into 180 60 times, and then 60 times 12 is 720. For number 12... Or sorry, 22, we're doing arc length. So the length of the arc is SOAR, or S equals theta times the radius. But theta has to be in radians. So the first thing we're going to do is take theta here. To get it into radians, we multiply by pi over 180. And then 5 goes into both of these. This would be 15. This would be 36. 3 goes into both those, 5 and 12. So then I'd get 9 times 5 pi over 12. 3 goes in each of these. And I end up with 15 pi over 4. So if it was kept exact, that would have been my answer. But because it wants it in decimal, I would literally multiply out 15 times pi and then divide it by 4. And I get 11.78, which is B. 23 says to find a positive angle less than 360. That's coterminal with the given angle. So this is 2 and a half pi. To find something that's in between 0 and 360, which is 2 pi, I'm going to subtract 2 pi or 4 pi over 2, and I end up with pi over 2, which is A. B would also be pi over 2, but you would see it written as that pi over 2. 24 is negative 234. Now we're in degrees. So to get something that's in between 0 and 360, I'm going to add 360 degrees to 234, negative 234. And I get 126 degrees. 25 says solve the log equation. So we're back to logs. Reject any value that's not in the domain of the original log expression, which means we have to check our answers. Make sure when we plug them back in here, we're not finding the... Um, we're not finding the log of a negative, which is actually happens in 20. In 20, if you plug back in the three halves, you end up getting an ln of a negative number. And so B is the actual answer for 20. All right, sorry, back down to 25. I would divide both sides by 4, and I'd get ln of 7x equals 2. ln is the same thing as log base, E. So the e comes over and picks up the 2. e to the second would equal 7x. And then divide both sides by 7. And x equals e squared over 7, which is d. 26, convert the degrees to radians. So to go from degrees to radians, we're doing uh, theta times pi over 180. So we can 9 goes into both of these. It would be 6 and 20, and then cut in half, 3, and 10. So 3 pi over 10 radians. Twenty seven says solve, and then be sure to reject. So these are the ones we have to check again. Because it's two logs on one side, I'm going to condense it down. So it's log base 4. Because it's subtraction, it would be division. x plus 4 over x minus 2 would equal 3. And then the 4 comes over and picks up the 3. 4 to the 3rd equals x plus 4 over x minus 2. 64 equals x plus 4 over x minus 2. Multiply both sides by x minus 2. And I get 64x minus 128 equals x plus 4. Subtract the x. 63x. Add the 128 equals 132, divide both sides by 63, and then these are both divisible by 3, this would be 44, and this is 21. So then we check 44 over 21 into both of these, 44 over 21 would be subtracted, and then 2 would be 42 over 21, so it works, and we get to keep that 44 over 21. All right, for the next one, I'm going to bring in a unit circle so we get the visual on it. So 
So secant of pi over 6, I want to locate pi over 6, which is this coordinate point here. The cosine there would be the x value, which would be root 3 over 2, which means the secant is 2 over root 3. And that gets rationalized to 2 root 3 over 3, which is d. All right, 29 is a point on the terminal side of the angle. So we're going to set up a triangle where my x value is 15, my y value is 20. And you want you to find sine, since it's Sokotoa, sine would be opposite over hypotenuse. So I already have the 20. I need the hypotenuse. 20 squared would be 400. 15 squared is 225. So 625 equals c squared and that is 25. So I'd get 20 over 25 which is 4 fifths. 30 says uh, two sides of a right triangle is given. Find the indicated trig function of the given angle and then give an exact answer with a rational denominator. So for cosecant which is a reciprocal of sine it would be hypotenuse over opposite. I've got to find the missing side here, so 2 squared plus 9 squared, 4 plus 81 is 85, and this is the square root of 85. So hypotenuse and opposite of theta, which is up here at the top, opposite would be 9, hypotenuse would be square root of 85, and I get C squared 85 over 9. 31 says the cosine of theta is 8 ninths, so for this one, Cosine would be adjacent hypotenuse. And then we're missing the opposite side. But it also says that tangent would be less than zero. So for cosine to be positive, which happens in the first quadrant and the fourth quadrant, and tangent to be negative, that's only going to happen in the fourth quadrant. So if you wanted to draw it in the quadrant it needs to go in, then my 8 would be here. And the unknown side is going to be negative. The 9 is still the hypotenuse. So I'm going to do 8 squared plus x squared equals 9 squared, 64, plus x squared equals 81. Subtract that, 64, 17. And it's negative because, again, we'd be in the fourth quadrant. So now the sine of this angle, which is what we're looking for, it would be here, it would be opposite, which is negative 17. Actually, sorry, negative square root of 17 over the hypotenuse, which is 9. That's D. All right, back to our unit circle again. So this one says tangent of negative pi over 2. Negative pi over 2 would be at the bottom here, where 3 pi over 2 is. And if you remember your tangents, the tangents at the top and the bottom are undefined. If you don't, then 0, negative 1 would give me negative 1 over 0, which is also undefined negative 5 pi over 4, I could find positive 5 pi over 4, which is here. Fold it in half, and I'm in my second quadrant. The over 4 has the coordinate point root 2 over 2 and root 2 over 2. Second quadrant, the x would be negative, the y would be positive. So secant is the reciprocal of the x value, negative 2 over root 2, which gets rationalized. Negative 2 root 2 over 2, which is just negative root 2. All right, 34 says the tangent is negative and it's in quadrant two. So I know I'm going to the left and up. This would be opposite adjacent. One of them is, one of them is negative. The um, vertical side is going to be a positive eight and the horizontal side is going to be my negative three. And then I got to find cosine, so I need my hypotenuse. Um, three squared plus eight squared would be nine plus 64. And this is 73, so C would equal the square root of 73. Theta is here, so then the cosine would be negative 3 over root 73, which gets rationalized to negative 3 root 73 over 73. 35, now it's in the, it's giving you the coordinate points of negative 4 and negative 3. So negative 4, negative 3 is in my third quadrant. Theta would be here. 
This is a triple. Missing side would be five. Secant would be hypotenuse over adjacent, which is five over negative four. Number 36 says find the exact value of this expression if theta is 45. So this would be 45 degrees. That's my root 2 and my root 2. It's positive. The cosine would be root 2 over 2. Flip it, and I end up with a positive root 2. Secant of pi over 4 is the same value, just in radians, so it's also root 2. Cotangent of 115 pi over 6. So this is obviously, it's an over 6. I know my over 6 are root 3 over 2 and 1 half. Because it's cotangent, the tangent would be root 3 over 3. The cotangent's the reciprocal of that, which is root 3. Now all I have to do is locate my sign because it narrows that down to B and C. So 115 pi over 6. So convert 115 over 6 into a mixed number. And it's 19 and 1 pi over 6. Which means that odd puts it on the left. 19 pi would be here. 1, 6 is the first quadrant past that. Which means I'm in quadrant. 1, 2, 3. And since all students take calculus, my tangent's going to be positive, which, which makes my cotangent positive, And I have a positive root 3. We're going to start by identifying a, which is in front of the trig function. a is 2. The absolute value of that was my amplitude, so amp is 2. My b is in between the trig function and the variable, so b is 2. And the period is 2 pi over 2, which is pi. So then I would take that. I would look for a phase shift. There's none this time, which would be in parentheses with this added or subtracted here. There's no phase shift. So my first key point is 0, and then it's pi times a fourth, pi times a half, pi times 3 fourths, and the last one is the period, which is pi. So this stays, pi over 4, pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, and pi would be my key points, 0, pi over 4, pi over 2, pi 3 pi over 4. Actually, sorry, this is going to get squeezed in here. There'd be one more in there. 3 pi over 4 and then pi. And because it's sine, it would start at 0. It would go up to the amplitude, back down, down to the negative amplitude, and back up again. So spacing is a little bit off there, but that's how it would look. If you look at what's here, the one that matches that is A. Okay, 40 is cosine. So same process, different curve shape, that's all. The negative A means this is upside down. The amplitude is still the absolute value of that, which is 3. The B is 3, which means the period is 2 pi over 3. No phase shift, so the first point is at 0. Then 2 pi over 3 times a fourth. Then 2 pi over 3 times a half. Then 2 pi over 3 times 3 fourths. Last one is 2 pi over 3. So this would reduce to pi over 6. Pi over 3 pi over 2, and then 2 pi over 3. So this is pretty squished, like in here. You'd get 0, pi over 6, pi over 3, pi over 2, 2 pi over 3. And because it's cosine, normally we start at the amplitude, but it's a negative cosine. We're starting at the negative amplitude, coming up, up, down, down. And my curve looks like that. 
So if you compare that with what's given to you, that would be A. Then we get tangent. So for tangent, our A is two and that's how high up and down our quarter and three quarter point go. Then I take the period, which is pi over B. Instead of two pi over B, it's just pi over four. I set that equal to, so I set four X equal to negative pi over two and four X equal to positive pi over two. Divide both sides by four, multiply by a fourth, and I get x equals negative pi over four, or pi over eight, sorry. Divide by four, multiply by a fourth, x equals pi over eight. Those are my middle two asymptotes. From the one on the left, I'm gonna subtract pi over four. To the one on the right, I'm gonna add pi over four. So this becomes two pi over eight, or negative three pi over eight. And this becomes 2 pi over 8 or positive 3 pi over 8, which means my four asymptotes are negative 3 pi over 8, negative pi over 8, positive pi over 8, and 3 pi over 8. So a little less than negative a half, negative 3 pi over 8, negative pi over 8, positive pi over 8, and positive 3 pi over 8. That's where your asymptotes would go. You're gonna find the point halfway between. And then because it's tangent, it starts on the left down at the negative A and comes up to the positive A. Down, up, down, up. And my curve passes through those points. So if you look, I definitely have a line before pi over two which matches with B. All right, then two secant X plus pi over two. So because it's secant, we're first gonna graph two cosine X plus pi over two. Our amp is two. Our B is one, so the period is two pi. Our normal key points would be at zero, two pi times a fourth, which is pi over two, two pi times a half, which is pi, two pi times three fourths, which is three pi over two, and the last one would have been two pi. Because there's a phase shift this time, this is adding or subtracting from the X, I'd set it equal to zero, and my phase shift is a negative pi over two. So from our original key points, we are subtracting pi over two. This would be negative pi over two, zero, two pi over two, minus pi over two is pi over two, two pi over two, which is pi. This would be four pi over two, three pi over two. So negative pi over two, zero pi over two pi three pi over two and your amplitude is two so it's cosine which means start at the amplitude come down down up up you're going to drop the sides down on both directions so you get your added asymptotes everywhere there's a zero that's an asymptote and then the curves bounce off Compare that to what's given. And it's D. All right, for 43, you're completing the identity. So this goes back to all those trig identity um, where you're using your co-functions or your Pythagorean identities and that kind of stuff. So... For something like 43, um, you could try to move your denominators up to make them the reciprocal functions, but it's not going to help in this case. So we want to condense this into one fraction. So I would have to give it a like denominator. I'd have to multiply this and this by sine, and I'd end up with sine squared x. Multiply this and the top by cosine, so plus cosine squared x would be over cosine 
x and then sine x. So sine squared plus cosine squared is 1 according to the Pythagorean identities. And then I get 1 times cosine, 1 over cosine times sine. And when these come to the numerator, they become the reciprocal functions. So this would be secant x times cosecant x. And that is choice C. Number 440 says to use the reference angle to find the exact value of the expression. Don't use a calculator. So 930 is obviously too big. It is bigger than um, 360 by double. So if I subtract 720 from it, I end up with a tan of 210. And 210 on my unit circle would be 30 past 180. And that coordinate point there is negative root 3 over 2 and negative 1 half. And the tangent, because it's an over 6, is root 3 over 3. So because it's in the third quadrant, my tangent is going to be positive, and then it's root 3 over 3. Forty-five says tan squared times sine equals tan squared. So we're solving here. I need to get everything to one side, so I'd get tan squared x sine x minus tan squared x equals zero. And then I can factor out a tan squared x. So this would be sine x minus one equals zero. Split and solve here. And I'm looking for where tangent would be plus and minus the square root of zero, which is still zero. Tan is at zero on the right and the left of our unit circle, which is zero and pi. And then sine x equals one is where my y is one, and that happens at pi over two. So b is the solution. D has pi over 2. It has pi and pi over 2, but it has 2 pi. And notice here that that's a parenthesis, so we don't include 2 pi. All right, 45 is back to an identity. So cosecant squared x times secant squared x. If you look at the options here, it's keeping it in terms of cosecant and secant. Cosecant squared x is part of my Pythagorean identities. It would be cotangent squared x plus 1 equals cosecant squared x. So I can replace it with cotangent squared x plus 1 times secant x. And then cotangent squared x times secant x plus secant x. Cotangent would be cosine squared x over sine squared x and secant is 1 over cosine. That cancels through one of them and I end up with cosine x over sine squared x plus secant x. And then you can separate one of these signs out here. So 1 over sine x times cosine over sine would be cotangent x plus secant x. And then this is cosecant x, cotangent x, plus secant x. Now the order is switched, but it is the same value because it's addition as b. All right, 47, you can factor out a sine squared, and I'd get 1 plus cotangent squared. 1 plus cotangent squared is cosecant squared. And sine squared times 1 over sine squared results in just 1, which is D. 
48, we're solving. So you can take out a sine here, sine of x. 1 minus 2 cosine of x. Split and solve. Sine is 0 at 0 and pi. Negative 1 cosine of x would be 1 half at the over 3's where it's positive. So positive pi over 3. And then cosine is also pi over 3 at 5 pi over 3. So I'm looking for four answers. 0 pi, pi over 3, and 5 pi over 3. 49, you're going to split and solve. And I'd get tan of x equals negative 1. And cosine of x equals negative 1. Tan is negative 1 in the second quadrant. And the fourth quadrant at the over 4s, which would be pi over 4 and 5 pi over 4, and cosine, which is your x value, is negative 1 at 0. So this is A. All right, systems of equation using substitution. So I would look to see if this is, there's an easy way to um, isolate one of the variables. On the bottom here, I can make 3x equal 3 minus 3y, and then divide everything by 3. And I get x equals 1 minus y. Take that. We'll get into the first equation. Distribute 8 minus 15y would equal 83. Subtract the 8. Negative 15y would equal 75 divided by negative 15. And y equals So I'm going to take that negative 5 and plug it back into what we solve for x. And I get 1 minus a negative 5. And that gives me my x, which is 6. 51. Now it says by addition. So we want to get them on the same side. So I'm going to move the 6x. So it's 6x plus 3y equals 9. Move the 3y. 2x plus 3y equals 33. And then I need them to cancel out. So if I just change the signs on the bottom... I get 4x, this cancels, equals negative 24. x would equal negative 6. And then I want to plug that back in. I can plug it back in anywhere. So let's say I go to the bottom. 2 times negative 6 equals 33 minus 3y. Negative 12. Subtract the 33. Negative 3y equals negative 45. And y equals negative 3, 15. So negative 6, 15 is C. For 52, this is your three variable. So I want to make sure I can find two equations by canceling out the same variable. If I were to cancel, let's say I grab row 1 and row 2. I can only cancel the x's or the y because the z's already gone. So if I'm going to multiply, let's say I multiply this by 4, I get 4x plus 4y equals 24. And then I'm going to add that to 3x minus 4y minus 4z equals negative 9. 7x, these cancel, minus 4z equals 15. Now these, with these... I can multiply the bottom row by negative 4. So 7x minus 4z equals 15. And negative 4x plus 4z equals negative 12. 3x equals 3. x would equal 1. I can take it and plug it back in either one that had two variables. So if I plug it back in here, 1 minus z equals 3, negative z would equal 2, and z equals negative 2. And then those have to go back into something that has a y. So I can even grab the top one and just do the x. 1 plus y equals 6, and y equals 5. So 1, 5, negative 2 is c. And the last one on this page, solve by substitution. So I want to solve if I solve for x or y, it doesn't matter. x could equal 3 plus 2y. If I were to solve for y, I'd only have to replace the y. Instead of having 2, we are going to have to expand and foil, foil this.
So if I expand and FOIL, this is 9 plus double the 6, so 12y plus square y, 4y squared. Distribute here, negative 3y minus, so the negative would go here and here, and then multiply times 2y, so 2y squared. I'd end up with 2y squared plus 9y, so that these are gone, these are gone, subtract that 20. Minus 11 equals 0. First times last here. 2 times negative 11 is negative 22. Factors of negative 22 that sum to 9 would be negative 2, positive 11. So 2y squared minus 2y plus 11y minus 11. Take out a 2y. Take out an 11. And I get y minus 1 and 2y plus 11. So the y's equal 1 and negative 11 halves. So I can cancel, cancel, cancel. I already know it's here. I'm going to double check by plugging back in to here my y. So x equals 3 plus 2 times 1 which is 5, and that's the first coordinate, and then x equals 3 plus 2 times negative 3 minus 11, which is negative 8, and that's the second one there. What your reference sheet looks like that you'll be given. So that top left is the conic stuff, and then you've got your unit circle, and then you've got your fundamental trig stuff, and then the law of cosines, the sequences and series formulas, and the area of the oblique triangle, and then Heron's formula and law of signs. So this is what will get, get given to you. I can actually put it right on the review assignment if that's easier. Like I can just put the PDF right on the review assignment. And then I would say while you're reviewing, use this, like so you know where things are so they're easy to find when you're not like searching for things. Um, so this is part two. It continues with elimination or addition because those means this mean the same thing. 55 says a method of your choice. So you can either use um, substitution or elimination. I obviously wouldn't re recommend graphing because you won't have graph paper. And then you get into the matrices. So within the matrices, you could see addition, you could see multiplication, you could see subtraction. This one is multiplication. So remember the test for a matrix is figure out the dimensions of each. So what would be the dimension of, t of A or the order of A? Two by three, and then B would be? Three by one. So then you want to check to make sure the middle two are the same, and they are. And then the outer two is your actual result. So let's say you get lucky this is multiple choice that maybe there's only one option that's a two by one. And if you look at your multiple choice this time, there is. Okay? There's only B. B is the only two by one. If not, then I'm going to multiply it out. So if it's a two by one, it means there's two rows and one column. So I would do negative four times four, which is negative 16, plus two times six, which is 12, negative five times negative seven, which is positive 35. And then from here we get 31. The next one would be row two. So negative three times four is negative 12. 8 times 6 is 48, and 2 times negative 7 is negative 14, and add those together, 36 minus 14, which is 22, and that's where B comes from. But because it's multiple choice, I would strongly encourage you to try to, like, use some tips and tricks to uh, eliminate values at least, and that should make it a little bit easier. Okay, 57 goes back to the equations of the ellipses. So if it's a ellipse, which first of all is very important to know what conic it is, and then you're given that the foci is negative 2, 0, and 2, 0, that means that's on my x-axis here and here. If the foci is on that axis, that means that the vertices are also on that axis, which means this is a horizontal ellipse, which means the x squared gets the a. So already I can look at my answer choices and eliminate anything in which the x has the smaller value which leaves only one option, okay? Let's say it didn't. I would then go to the next piece. So this tells me C is 2. My next piece of information is that the x-intercepts are at negative 8 and positive 8, which means my A is 8. 
And then c squared equals a squared minus b squared for an ellipse. So 2 squared would equal 8 squared minus b squared. 4 would equal 64 minus b squared. Negative b squared would equal negative 60. And b squared would equal 60. So then I know the a squared, because 8 was a, is 64. And the b squared is 60. And that gives me that formula. 58 is the reverse. It gives you the equation and you have to graph it. So the first thing I would notice is that it's an ellipse. There's a plus in the middle and it says it's an ellipse. My center is at 1, 2. The A squared is the bigger number, which is 9, and that tells me this is horizontal. The A is 3. The B squared is 4. The B is 2. So then I'd go 1, 2 for my center. A means right and left because it's horizontal. Right 3, left 3, and my B is 2, up 2, down 2, and then make your ellipse. Questions on that one? Yeah. Yeah. All right, I'm going to go back and finish the ones that we had skipped earlier. So number 54 says solve by um, addition, which is the same as elimination. We can actually just add these because they will cancel. And I get negative 6y equals 20. Nope, sorry, 30. And then divide both sides by negative 6. And y is negative 5. Looking at your answer choices, that eliminates D and C. And then take and plug that back in. So I'm going to plug it back into the top. 4x plus 6 times negative 5 equals negative 26. 4x minus 30 equals negative 26. 4x equals 4 and x equals 1. So my answer is 1, negative 5. 55 says solve by the method of your choice. So this is set up, I would say, easy to do um, elimination if we just change these signs. So I'd get x squared plus 4x. These are going to cancel. Equals 21. Bring the 21 on the side with the other two. Factors of 21 that sum to positive 4 would be positive 7 and negative 3. And then split and solve, and I get negative th 7 and 3. So those are the x values, and that really just eliminates, I mean, leaves with you b, but we want to plug them back in to get the y values. So if I plug it back into this top one, I'd get negative 7 squared plus y squared equals 45. 49 plus y squared equals 45. y squared would equal a negative 4. And when I square root both sides, I get and a non-real number, which is actually means that this one gets ruled out. You can't solve the matching y there. If I plug in the 3, y squared, this would be 9, would equal 36, and y would equal plus and minus 6. So with the 3, we get negative 6 and also positive 6, which is c. You're welcome. So again, like, first of all, I would look at my answers. All four of them are horizontal, so that didn't help. But as soon as I found my zero was, I actually think these are the same answers, are they? No, they're shifted over a little bit. As soon as you see that it's horizontal and your center is in that first quadrant, it narrows it down to this one and this one, then you just got to figure out your A and B. Sure. All right, so what would you have to do first with 59? What's it have to equal in order for it to be standard form? One. So I'd have to divide everything by 36. And I'd get x minus 2 squared over 9 plus y plus 1 squared over 4 equals 1. I'll go back and graph it on the video, but at least it gets started. 60 gives you foci and vertices of a hyperbola. So the fact that foci is 0, negative 10, and positive 10, negative 10, positive 10, 
This tells me that it's vertical, which means the Y comes first and I've already eliminated two of my answer choices. The C would be 10. The center is at zero, zero. And the vertices are at zero, seven and negative seven, which means the A is seven. A squared comes first, which means 49 should both be in, in this first and it's the, that way for both. So then the last thing I have to find is B squared. C squared equals A squared plus B squared for a hyperbola. So 100 would equal 49 plus B squared and B squared is going to be 51, which is A. For 61, now we've got to complete the square. So I'm going to group together the X squared and the 64X. Group together the 9Y squared and the 54Y and then bump the negative one to the other side. We have to take the coefficient off the squareds. So the 16 comes out of both the X squared and the 64X. The nine comes off of both the Y squared and the 64Y. I have to fill in that space. So I take the four, I divide it by two, I square it, it's four, I'm gonna add four here. Normally I'd add four over here, but I have to multiply by 16 first which means I'm adding 64. Then I take the six, divide it by two, it's three squared, it's nine, I'm gonna add it here. Normally I'd add it down here, but I have to multiply it by nine first, which means I'm adding 81. So then I end up with 16 x plus two squared plus nine y plus three squared equals, this is 63, plus, right, 63 plus 81, yeah, which is 144, that should be 144. And then I'd have to divide everything by 144. And I'd get x plus two squared over nine plus y plus three squared over, six, over 12 equals one. There's the standard form of your ellipse. Wait, not 12, sorry, 16, which is this one. We're gonna come back up and graph 59. So we got it to the point of this, which means my center is two negative one because the larger numbers under the x this means it's horizontal we're going to go right and left the square to nine which is three so one two three one two three and the b squared is four so we're going to go up and down two and there's your ellipse which matches a <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna go back to the ellipses ones on the videos because it's a little bit more of the same, except for the major axis. Remember, major axis is 2A, minor axis is 2B. That helps with the next one. So I wanna go to this 64, that's my determinant, okay? When you're finding the determinant of a three by three, remember we duplicate the first two columns to the right, and then you multiply down from top left to bottom right. You're gonna get those three values and add them together. And then you go back the other way, top right, bottom left. Sorry, I'm here. The five should be the start of this. Five, three, one. And then one, four, two, and then two, two, five. Multiply down those diagonals, and then we take what we get from the first one and subtract from it what you get from the second one. So that's how we do the determinant of a three by three. Then you get Kramer's rule. Okay, this is just a two variable one though. So with the Kramer's rule, for D, we take the values of X and Y, 
And then we do the Jesus fish to get the determinant. And then we do dx. And dx, we take out the x's and we put in the constants. And then do the Jesus fish to find the determinant. And then dy, you take out the, con the y's, so the x's stay, put in the constants, and then you do, again, the little Jesus fish. And then your x equals dx over d, and your y equals dy over d. So that determinant is that fish, like the around in a circle and subtract. 67 goes back to hyperbolas. So if I have a center at 6, 5, first of all, I would go to all my answer choices. It should be an x minus 6 and a y minus 5, which means these two have already been eliminated. Then the focus is at 0, 5. And, five, and the vertex is at 5, 5. So the focus, 5, 5, tells you that it points in that direction, which means it's horizontal, which means the x comes first, which is consistent with what we have for our answer choices already. And the distance from the center to the vertex is 1, which means a squared is 1. A always comes first, which means I can already narrow it down to D. The C is the distance from the center to the focus, which is 6. So if I wanted to find B, it would be C squared equals A squared plus B squared. 36 would equal 1 plus B squared, and B squared would be 35. But again, answer choices already help you from the get-go. All right, 68 is your standard form of the hyperbola, so I'll go back to that one. You're going to complete the square. It will be a hyperbola. The directions are cut off on this page, but it says use the vertices and asymptotes to graph the hyperbola, then find the equation of the hyperbola. All right, so looking at number 62, it says the major axis horizontal. So if it's horizontal, that means it's wider than it is tall, which means that this is going to have the a squared under the x squared. The axis length is 20, so 2a would equal 20, and a is 10. So now already we know it's x squared over 100. And then the minor axis being 12 means this is 2b, and b is 6, which means the y squared gets the 36. The center is 0, 0, so it stays like that. And then we're looking for that answer choice, which is a. For 63, if your foci are plus and minus 3, that means your center is at 0, 0, your C is 3, and it's horizontal. And then your vertices are at negative 7 and positive 7, which means your A is 7. So because it's an ellipse, C squared equals A squared minus B squared. 9 would equal 49 minus b squared. Negative b squared would equal negative 40. So b squared is 40. It's horizontal, so the x gets the bigger a, which would be 7. So it's x squared over 49 plus y squared over 40 equals 1. For 64, we talked about how to set it up before, but we'll work it through now. So 1 times... 3 times 5 is 15, 2 times 4 times 1 is 8, 5 times 2 is 10, times 2 is 20, and then we're going to add these up. So 27 plus 20, 47, and then go back the other way. So 5 times 3 times 1 is 15, 1 times 4 times 2 is 8, 2 times 2 times 5, that's 4 times 5, which is 20. And this is 27 again, plus 20, and that's 47. So then we do the first one, which is 47, minus the second one, which is also 47, and the determinant here is 0. All right, 65 is Kramer's rule to solve the system. So first we'll rewrite the system as a matrix. And then for D, we do the x's and the y's. So we do 5, 4, 3, 1, and then you're doing the determinant. So 1 times 5, 
minus 4 times 3, or 5 minus 12, which is negative 7. Then for dx, we take out the x's and put in the constants. So negative 5, negative 11, and then 3, 1. Negative 5 minus a negative 33 becomes plus 33, and this is 28. And then for dy, we take out the y's, so we leave the x's, we take out the y's and put the, y, the constants in negative 5, negative 11, so negative 55 minus a negative 20 becomes plus 20, and that's negative 35. So then the x is the d of x, which is 28 over negative 7, or negative 4, and the y is d of y, negative 35 over d, which is negative 7, and that's a positive 5. So negative 4, 5 is the solution. 66 is just the determinant, so I would multiply. It's a negative 8 times 3 minus negative 1 times negative 9, negative 24 minus, this becomes a positive 9, so negative 33. We already worked through 67. 68 is the equation of a hyperbola. So we've got to complete the square here. We're going to group the y squared and the minus 2y and the negative 8, 9x squared minus 36x. Bump the 44 to the other side. For the y, we don't have to take anything out. So we would take the 2, divide it by 2. That's 1 squared. It's 1. So we're going to add that here and here. 4, and I'd get y minus 1 squared. For the x, we have to take out the negative 9. So I'd get x squared plus 4x. Then you get the 4 divided by 2. That's 2 squared. It's 4. So we're adding a 4 in here. And normally we'd add the 4 here, but we have to multiply by that negative 9 first, which means we're actually going to be subtracting 36. And then this is negative 9. Square root the x squared. Square root the 4. Take the sign from the middle. Put it in the parentheses and square it. And then this is 45 minus 36, which is 9. It's a hyperbola, so it's got to be equal to 1. So we divide everything by 9. And I get y minus 1 squared over 9 minus x plus 2 squared over 1 equals 1. And that is this choice here, y minus 1 over 9. And then it, you don't have to put the over one underneath the x because that would obviously simplify. Hyperbola. So if this is my equation of my hyperbola, my center is at zero, zero. A squared is what's first. A squared is nine and A is three and it's under the y. So this tells me this is vertical. B squared is 36, so B is six. So if it's vertical, I'm going up and down the A, which is 3. And I'm going right and left the 6, which is the B. I would make the box. I would draw the asymptotes through the corners. And it's vertical, so the branches are going to go off the top and the bottom. Which already tells me it's A before I even have the asymptotes. So the asymptotes would be y equals k plus and minus it's vertical, so it's a over b, x minus h. k is zero, so it'd be plus and minus the a, which was three over six times x, and that's where the one half comes from. Questions on that one? Okay, so then for something like 70, I would want to plot it. I'll go back. Okay, for 70, it says the, find the location of the center, the vertices, the foci for the hyperbola. So the first thing we can identify is the center would be 3, negative 4. So that rules out C and D already. Because the Y is squared, this means I'm moving from 3, negative 4, up and down the a so i'd go up and down a squared is nine i go up and down three one two three so three negative one is one vertice and then go down one two three and three negative seven is the other vertice and again we've already eliminated 
to continue to find the foci, we would get c squared equals a squared, which is 9, plus b squared. So c squared is 13, and c equals plus and minus the square root of 13. Well, c is the square root of 13. But we're going to add and subtract it to the y coordinate of my center. So my x stays the same, but negative 4, you'd add and subtract the square root 13. And that further confirms choice A. Okay, 71 is the focus and the directrix. So this is a parabola. If it's 22, 0, let's just say we mark, mark this at 22, 0. And the directrix is x equals negative 22. Then I know it's going to... Oh, the focus, sorry. This is the focus. I know that the center is going to be, or the vertex is going to be halfway between, which is 0, 0. And I know it's going to face to the right, which means it's a y squared and a positive 4p. So it's y squared equals 4. p is the distance from the 0, 0 to the directrix or the focus, and that's 22. So it would be 4 times 22 and then x. So y squared equals 88x. 72 says to find the standard form of the equation of the hyperbola. So we know that it's pointing to the right and the left, which means it's an x squared minus y squared. We can already eliminate half the choices. The center's at 0, 0. The a is the distance from the center to the vertex. So the a is 5, which would make a squared 25. And that goes under the x. And then the b is 4, so the b squared would be 16, confirming that last choice. 73 says find the standard form of the equation of the hyperbola with a foci at 0 plus and minus 6. So I know it's vertical, which means it's a y squared first. And that c is 6. The vertices would be at 0, negative 3, and positive 3, which means my negative 3, which means my a is 3. So then the a squared would be 9. Both of these still have that. The last thing we would need to find is b. So c squared equals a squared plus b squared because it's a hyperbola. So 36 would equal 9 plus b squared. b squared would equal 27. And that means b is our answer. 74, we're multiplying matrices. This is a 2 by 2 and a 2 by 2. The middle two match, so I can be done. The outer two is the answer. It's a two by two. The first one is row one, column one. So it'd be negative one times negative two plus three times negative one, or two minus three, which is negative one. Then row one, column two. So negative one times zero plus three times four. Zero plus 12, which is 12. Row two, column one, negative four minus two, negative six. And last but not least, row two, column two, two times zero, zero, two times four, eight. So my answer is A, negative one, 12, negative six, eight. 75, we are putting this into standard form by completing the square. The Y has the squared term. This is a parabola. There's only one. So I keep the y squared and the 2y on one side. I'm going to bump the, neg the 4x to the other side, making it negative, and the 3 to the other side, making it positive. I want to complete the square here, so I take the 2, divide it by 2. That's 1, square it, add the 1 here and here. Square root the first term, square root the last term, take the signs from the middle, put it in parentheses and square it, and I get negative 4x plus 4. Now, standard form says that you can't have anything attached to the x over here. So the left side is going to stay the same, but the right side, you take the negative 4, and I get negative 4x minus 1, which is C. 76 says find the vertex focus and directrix of the parabola with the given equation. It's a y squared with a positive 4p, so it's going to face the right. My vertex would be the opposite of what follows x, so 3, opposite of what follows y, 2. Already that rules out b and c, 1, 2, 3, up 2, 4p equals 20, so p is 5. 
I'd go to the right. One, two, three, four, five. One, two. And that's my focus. This points to the right. And that would be eight, three. No, sorry, eight, two. And then I'd go to the left. One, two, three, four, five. So positive three minus five, which is negative two. X equals negative two. So that means D is the correct answer. Seventy-seven says match the equation to the graph. So this is a parabola that faces to the right. It's got a y squared and a positive four p that already rules out D. My uh, vertex would be negative one one. So negative one one negative one one. This looks like this would be at negative one, negative one here. So I can rule out B. So then when I'm looking between A and C, I could find either, I could find the Y intercept by plugging in zero. I could find the X intercept by plugging in zero for Y. So let's just say, I, so an easy way to determine um, what if it's A or C is just to plug. You could plug in for the X, but it's gonna be even easier to plug in for the Y. So let's say I plug in five to see if it crosses through here. I would get five minus one squared equals seven X plus one. I'd get four squared equals seven X plus one. 16 would equal seven X plus seven. Subtract the seven, nine equals seven. Nines divided by seven and X is equal to one and two sevenths. So because that's, so we're looking for one and two sevenths, five as a coordinate point. One and two sevenths, five is here, not here. One and two sevenths is all the way up here for this one. So I know my answer is A. All right, and then 79, this is where 8.1 started. Wait, 8.1? 10.1? 11.1, sorry. Switching the pre-calc book with the algebra two book. This is 11 one, okay, where you're gonna find a certain amount of terms in the sequence. Hopefully this feels a little Okay, 78, another parabola. This time it's a positive y squared, so it points to the right. My vertex is one, negative one. If I look at those already, that narrows down this one. And then my four p is five, so it means it's positive, it points to the right. That rules out this one. P would be one and, well, it would be five fourths, which is one and one fourth. And then I couldn't find that exact point on my graph. So I'm gonna take and plug in something like two and see what happens. So if I plug in two to my X, I get Y plus one squared equals five, two minus one. Y plus one squared equals five. Y plus one would equal plus and minus the square root of five. Y would equal negative one plus and minus square root five. And because square root five is just slightly bigger than square root four, like a 2.1, let's say, I'm gonna get negative one minus 2.1 and negative one plus 2.1, negative 3.1 and 1.1. Those are the y's when the x is, what did I plug in, two. So I'm gonna go to where X is two, and there's my 1.1, and there's my negative 3.1, which matches C. If it was two, you're all the way up here, which does not match what we got. So I know D is not the correct one. Okay, 79 starts your sequence. So this one says, find the first four terms of the sequence, and that's my form. So I'm gonna plug in one, one plus one over two times one minus one. And I get two over two minus one, which is one. So that first one is two, not negative two. The second one I'm plugging in two, two plus one over two times two minus one, which is three over four minus one, which is three, and that's one. Then I would plug in, if I didn't see it already, I would plug in three. So three plus one over two times three minus one is four over six minus one, which is five. 
And then I would plug in 4, 4 plus 1 over 2 times 4 minus 1, 5 over 8 minus 1, which is 7. And that's B. For 80, I'm going to do the same thing. Plug in 1, 4 times 1 minus 1, 4 minus 1 is 3. 4 times 2 minus 1, 8 minus 1 is 7. Already can narrow it down. 4 times 3 minus 1 would have been 12 minus 1, which is 11. And 4 times 4 minus 1, 16 minus 1, which is 15. Fresh is what you just took your test on. Okay, here's an indicated sum. What kind of sequence is this? What's 81? It's arithmetic. So you actually have two choices with this one. Use the arithmetic sum. which is n over 2 times first plus last. Or you can plug in 3, you can plug in 4, you can plug in 5, you can plug in 6. What you cannot use is any of the shortcuts because the bottom number is not 1. Okay, so be careful there. All right, um, 82 was back to the parabolas. 83 is your Gaussian elimination with back substitution. So this is your, it actually should be Gauss Jordan. It's 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. 0, 0, 0, and then your x, your y, your z. So 83 is looking to get your matrix into that system. 84 is back to substitution. 85, you're dealing with the law of cosines because you're given three side lengths. 86, this is 11.2, which is arithmetic. Okay, 81 is a sum. So this is actually an arithmetic sum because you're just adding, subtracting, and multiplying. So I know it's arithmetic, which means I can use either the first and last formula or I could plug in 3, 4, 5, and 6 and then add them all together at the end. To do first and last, I have to do n, which would be 6 minus 3 plus 1 or 3 plus 1, which is 4. So there's four terms. 4 goes over 2. First, I would take and plug in 3, so 2 times 3 minus 2 is 6 minus 2, which is 4. That's the first term. And the last, I'm going to take and plug in 6, so 12 minus 2 is 10. 2 times 14 would be 28. Number 8 is back to the parabola, 82, sorry, is back to a parabola. This time, it's an x squared with a positive 4p, so this is going to open upward. The vertex is negative 2, 3, negative 3. So that already rules out C, B. So I'm between um, A and D. Because it points to the right, negative 2, 1, 2, 3. And 8 equals 4P. P is 2. Not to the right, sorry. It opens up. I'm going to go up 2. That's negative 2, negative 1. That's the focus, and then the directrix down to would be a y equals negative 3. Nope, negative 5. Sorry, this is the focus. This, negative 2, negative 3. Add down from there, or go down from there, two more, and that's where your directrix is. Okay, I'm going to come back to 83 so we have more space. 84, I would divide one of these. So if I can get like x divided by y, x would equal 18 over y, and then plug it into the other one. So 18 over y squared plus y squared would equal 85. And then 18 squared is 324 over y squared plus y squared over 85. You can multiply everything by y squared to get rid of this denominator. I get 324 and plus y to the fourth equals 85y squared. Get everything to one side. This would be a minus. So then factors of 324, that sum to 85. Well, this would be squared and squared. 
are negative 81 and negative 4. And then I would split and solve this. y squared would equal 81. y would equal plus and minus the square root of 81. y would equal plus and minus 9. On the other side, y squared would equal 4. y would equal plus and minus square root 4. y would equal plus and minus 2. So now there are four y values. For the x equals, I would do 18 over negative 9, and that's negative 2. So negative 2, negative 9 is one answer. x equals 18 over positive 9, and that's 2. So 2, positive 9. x equals 18 over negative 2, and I get negative 9. So negative 2, negative 9. Nope, other way around, sorry. Negative 9, negative 2. And then x equals 18 over 2, and that's 9. So 9, 2. So then negative 2, negative. So it's where they're both positive, they're both negative. Which would be A. 85, now we're dealing with the law of cosine. So we want to start with the biggest angle because it's side, side, side. So I would do cosine of C equals A squared plus B squared minus C squared over 2AB. So cosine negative 1 of A is 6 squared plus B is 4 squared minus 7 squared over 2 times 6 times 4. And remember, we have to be careful where we group these and make sure that our mode is in degrees. So second cosine, put the parentheses, 6 squared plus 4 squared minus 7 squared. Close the parentheses, divided by, open the parentheses again. And I get angle C is 86.42 degrees, or 86.4, which rules out those two. Then if I go to A, cosine of A would equal B squared, which is 4 squared, plus C squared, which is 7 squared, minus A squared, which is 6 squared, over 2 times 4 times 7. Second, cosine, open the parentheses, 4 squared, plus 7 squared, minus 6 squared, close the parentheses, divided by, open them again, 2 times 4 times 7. And angle A is 58.8 degrees, so this is choice C. Okay, we're back to arithmetic sequences here. Find the formula for the general term of an arithmetic sequence um, and then find the indicated term given A1 and common difference D. So for 86, it's giving you A1 and D. So I would get A sub N equals A1, which is negative 8, minus D times N, or it would be plus D, but it's a negative 3, and minus 1, and then it wants A32. So negative 8 minus 3 times 32 minus 1, negative 8 minus 3 times 31, negative 8 minus 93, which is negative 101 or B. 87, find A150 when A1 is 7 and D is 6. So my nth term would be this. 7 plus 6, 150 minus 1. 7 plus 6 times 149. 7 plus 8, 94, which would be 901. This is number 83, which is the Gosh Jordan. So we're going to rewrite this in matrix form. 1, 1, 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, 5, 5, 5, 1, 1, 19. So the first goal is to get a 1 where this is, makes life easier moving forward. That's already there. Then I want a 0 where row 2 is. So I can do negative 1, row 2 plus row 1. I get negative 1 positive 1, negative 5, negative 5, plus 1, 1, 1, negative 1. Replace row 2. So 1, 1, 1, negative 1, 0, 2, negative 4, negative 6, and row 3, 5, 1, 1, 19. Now moving down, I want a 0 here. 
I could do negative 5 row 1 plus row 3. Negative 5, negative 5, negative 5, positive 5, 5, 1, 1, 19. 0, negative 4, negative 4, 24. Replaces row 3. It would be easy to get this one here if that makes it easier. You totally can do that now or you can keep going. 0, 2, negative 4, negative 6. 0, negative 4, negative 4, 24. Now I need a 0 here. I can multiply row 2 by 2. So 2, row 2, plus row 3. I get 0, 4, negative 8 negative 12, 0, negative 4, negative 4, 24, 0, 0, negative 12, positive 12. That's going to replace row 3, but I also need that 12 to be a 1, so I can multiply by negative 1, 12 now. 0, 0, 1, negative 1. Now I need a 0 where the negative 4 is, so I can multiply row 3 by 4, and add it to row two. And I get zero, zero, four, negative four, zero, two, negative four, negative six. Zero, two, zero, negative 10. That replaces row two, but I also need that two to be a one, so I can multiply by a half. One, 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 negative one. Zero, one, zero, negative five. Zero, zero, one, negative one. So uh, now I know X, or sorry, I know Y and I know Z. I need a zero where that one is. I need to use row three, negative one, row three plus row one. Zero, zero, negative one, 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 negative one. Replaces row one. And the last zero I need here, I have to use row two. Negative one, R2 plus R1. Zero, negative one, zero, five, one. One, zero, zero. One, zero, zero, five. So I get one, zero, zero, five. 0, 1, 0, negative 5, and 0, 0, 1, negative 1. And my answer is 5, negative 5, negative 1. 88 is not geometric. Remember, geometric is if the exponent has the variable in it. So this one, you would have to start by plugging in 3, then you'd plug in 4, then you'd plug in 5, and then you'd add them all together at the end. And again, you can't use a shortcut because the bottom number is not 1. 89 is angle, side, angle. This is a law of sines scenario. 92 is back to solving. 91 is using your unit circle. 92 is your um, coordinate point. So it's back to like what we did yesterday. 93 goes back to logs. 94 is arithmetic sequence. 95 is the sum of the geometric. So sum of geometric. You're going to have to find, oh, let me actually, instead of doing it that way, sorry, A1 times 1 minus R to the N over 1 minus R is the sum of geometric because it's finite. Okay, find the indicated sum. This is not geometric. It's not arithmetic, so we have to plug them in. So I'm going to plug in the 3. I get 3 squared plus 9. I'm going to plug in a 4. 4 squared plus 9. Plug in a 5. 5 squared plus 9. I'd get 9 plus 9, which is 18. 16 plus 9, 25. 25 plus 9, 34. And then add them all together. 18 plus 25 plus 34. And I get 77. 89 is law of sines. So if I want to find angle B first, I would do 180 minus 75 minus 50. And I get 55 degrees. So already I can eliminate 2. 
Then my complete ratio is B. So 7 over sine of 55 equals, if I want to do A over the sine of 50. Cross multiply. And divide. Seven sine fifty divided by sine of fifty five, and a is six point five. So now I know D is the choice. If I wanted to check for C, I would do seven over the sine of fifty five equals side C over the sine of seventy five. Cross multiply seven sine seventy five divided by sine fifty five. And I get 8.25 or 8, yeah, 8.25, which is what's here. Number nine says to solve on the interval of 0 to 2 pi. There are two different trig functions here, so we have to swap one out. Cosine, because cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1, cosine is the same thing as saying 1 minus sine squared. Distribute 2 minus 2 sine squared x plus sine x minus 2. Combine your like terms. Negative 2 sine squared x plus sine x. This would cancel. Equals 0. Then you can factor out a sine. And split and solve. So sine or the y is 0 at 0 and at pi. This would be negative 2 equals negative 1, and sine of x would equal 1 half. And sine equals 1 half at the over 6s in the first quadrant, so pi over 6, and in the second quadrant, so 5 pi over 6. And A is your answer. 91 says use the unit circle to find the value of the trig function. So again, reminder, you're going to get a reference sheet. That will have your unit circle on it. So if I'm looking for the tan at 7 pi over 6, I go to 7 pi over 6. Hopefully you remember your tangents at over 6 is our root 3 over 3. And that's in the third quadrant. So it's going to be a positive root 3 over 3. For 92, it says that my coordinate point is going to be 8, 3 eighths and root 55 eighths. So if my x is 3 eighths and my y is root 55 eighths, then you can find sine by doing opposite over hypotenuse. So 3 eighths squared plus square root of 55 eighths squared would equal the hypotenuse or the radius squared. This would be 9 over 64 plus 55 over 64 which is 64 over 64, and that's 1. Square root of 1 is 1. T, or the sine of T, would be opposite over a hypotenuse, which would be root 55 over 8 over 1, which is A. 93 says solve the log equation, and then make sure to check for your domain. So this only has one log, so this 3 is going to come over and pick up the other side. So 3 to the first would equal x squared minus 2x. I'm going to have to factor, so 0 equals x squared minus 2x minus 3. Factors of negative 3 that sum to positive 1. And I get x equals 3 and x equals negative 1. And then we want to check. So this is 3, that would be 9 minus 6, which is fine. But if this is negative 1, I get 1 minus a negative 2, which is also fine. So both of these answers get to be used. 94. Let's find the sum of the first 70 terms of the, an arithmetic sequence. So if I want to find the sum of an arithmetic sequence, it's the n over 2 first plus last. I know the number of terms is 70. I know the first one is 17. I don't know the last one yet. So I would do 23 minus 17 and I get d is 6. a n would equal a1 plus 6 times n minus 1. 
So if I want to find the 70th term, 17 plus 6 times 70 minus 1, 17 plus 6 times 69, 17 plus 4, 14 is 431. And that would be the 70th term. So then I would do 35 times 17 plus 431, 448, which is 15,680. 95 says find the sum of the first 14 terms of the geometric sequence. So now we're talking geometric, which is this formula. We know A1 is 5. 1 minus R would be 15 divided by 5 or 45 divided by 15. Either way, R is 3. The number of terms is 14 over 1 minus 3. So then 3 to the 14th. 4, 7, 8, 2, 9, 6, 9 over negative 2. 1 minus the 3 to the 14th is negative 4, 7, 8, 2, 9, 6, 8 divided by negative 2. And I get 2,000, no, 2,391,484. And then multiply that times 5. And I get 11, 9, 5, 7, 4, 20. And then, hey, okay, last page. So for 96, we're doing an infinite series. So this is geometric. A1, if I plug one in, I'd get five times negative 0 0.25 to the zero power. That's one, so it's five. 5 over 1 minus r is a negative 2 tenths or a negative 1 fifth. So minus a negative 1 fifth becomes 1 plus, and this becomes 5 fifths plus 1 fifth or 5 over 6 fifths. Keep, change, flip, and I get 25 sixths. 97 is an infinite geometric sequence where A1 is 4, 2 divided by 4, or 1 divided by 2, or 1 half divided by 1 tells me R is a half. So I'd get 4 over 1 minus 1 half. 4 over 1 half, keep, change, flip, and I get 8. 98 says find the indicated sum. Use the formula for the sum of the first n in terms of a geometric sequence. So A1, I'd be plugging this in, and I'd get 3 fourths. 3 fourths times 1 minus R is 3 fourths. To the n, the bottom number is 1, so the n is the top number, over 1 minus 3 fourths. 3 to the eighth six five six one four to the eighth six five five three six over this would be four fourths minus three fourths or one fourth then I have to give the numerator a like denominator so this becomes six five five three six over six five five three six six five five 3, 6 minus 6, 5, 6, 1. So I have 3 fourths on the front. Would equal 5, 8, 9, 7, 5 over 6, 5, 5, 3, 6, which is over 1 fourth. Keep, change, flip. 6, 5, 5, 3, 6 divided by 4. 16, 384. 3 does not go in there evenly. 5, 8, 9, 7, 5. 4 does not go on the top evenly. So I do 5, 8, 9, 7, 5 times 3. 17, 1,706. 
176,925 divided by 16384 times 4, 65536. So that matches C. 99 says find the sum of the first 13 terms of the geometric sequence. So we know A1. Negative one third divided by one sixth would be negative one third times six over one, and this is negative two. So then I would do a one, which is one sixth times one minus a negative two to the n, which is thirteen, over one minus a negative two negative 2 to the 13th is a negative, so this becomes minus a negative 8192, which becomes plus. Over this also becomes plus with 3, so I get 168193 over 3, 8193 divided by 3, 2731. And that's 2731 over 6, which is C. All right, number 100, find the formula for the sum of the first n terms of an arithmetic sequence. Um, so find the sum. Okay, so n over 2, 49 minus 1, or 40, the, the bottom number is 1, so it's 49 over 2. First term would be 4 minus 3, which is 1. Last term would be 4 times 49 minus 3, or 193. 24.5 times 194 is 4,753. 101 says write the formula for the general term. So the nth term for an arithmetic sequence, a n would equal a1, which is negative 22, Negative 30 minus a negative 22 tells you that D here is negative 8. So this would be minus 8 times N minus 1. Negative 22 minus 8N plus 8 is negative 14 minus 8N. Already that rules out all of them except for C. If you wanted to check the 20th term, negative 14 minus 8 times 20 negative 14 minus 160, which is negative 174. And last but not least, 102. Write the equation in its equivalent exponential form. 4 comes over and picks up the 3, drops off, leaving the 64. 4 to the 3rd is 64. All right, that's it.